Um, okay, first of all, I just want to say thank you for having us here to, to share our experience with IPv6 only uh, for our Wi-Fi project. Um, my name is Colin Donahue. Um, I work in Athlone Institute of Technology and I'm there for about 15 years now. Um, my main role is in the networking team uh, where we look after the firewall, uh, the Wi-Fi, the LAN, um, anything to do with the network pretty much. Um, I'm just going to hand you over to Ian to do a quick introduction before we get started. Hi, uh, Ian Hallisey. Yeah, I'm Senior Technical Officer here at Athlone IT, working with Colin, basically do the same work, the LAN, the WAN, um, firewall, DNS, anything to do with uh, connectivity for the Institute. Um, so we're delighted with the opportunity to just show what we've done with V6 only on our wireless network, which is campus-wide. So it's a full deployment of wireless network for the, the full campus. So I'll hand back to Colin, he'll start. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background about Athlone Institute of Technology. Um, we're a higher education institute located in the heart of the Irish Midlands. Uh, we offer courses undergraduate and postgraduate level and uh, a number of areas of research also. Um, we have over 6,000 students, um, more than 700 staff, and at the moment, Athlone IT and Limerick IT are in the process of joining up to become a technological university. So hopefully by September 2021, we will be operating as a TU. Uh, just to go through some of the topics of, uh, that we're going to go through today, um, our IPv6 timeline, our motivation for going with IPv6 only for our Wi-Fi network, um, the foundations or I guess some of the essential work we had done prior to the project that enabled us to go with IPv6 only, um, the goals for the project, and some of the features uh, of IPv6 that we use in the Wi-Fi that we may not have had in our dual stack network. Um, and at that point, I'll hand you over to Ian, and he'll just go through how it all works with the physical infrastructure, the wireless infrastructure, the network management side of things, and our overall experiences with IPv6 only. Okay, so um, I guess our IPv6 story starts with HEANET, um, which is the education and uh, research network provider for Ireland. And uh, it was at one of their annual conferences we first came across this um, new protocol called IPv6. Uh, as a result of one of those talks, we decided in 2012 that we wanted to put IPv6 onto our network. So we started off, we went with a, and created our IPv6 addressing plan. Uh, we had planned to go with native IPv6 from the start, uh, but we quickly found out that there was issues at the time with the likes of Skype and other peer-to-peer -peer applications. Um, and we also did some tests with NAT64 at that time, and we were experiencing some performance issues uh, with the firewall we were using that time. So uh, I suppose we, what we decided to do then it, instead is just to go on 2013, we decided to dual stack our web servers. So at least that our websites were going to be accessible over IPv6 uh, from the internet. So we enabled IPv6 on our external DNS infrastructure. We dual stacked our web servers and uh, added our quad A records and, and that worked really well. Um, our next opportunity, I suppose, to, to uh, look at IPv6 again was in 2015. And um, at that point in time, we had to update our controllers to be able to bring in more access points onto our network. And so we decided at that stage to dual stack, um, dual stack for all our Wi-Fi clients. And as that worked really well later that year, um, we went and dual stacked our LAN also, um, all our students and staff VLANs and all, well, most of our server infrastructure at that time. So we've been using IPv6, I suppose, and dual stack for quite a while. And it was around this time last year where um, we were going out to tender for a full refresh of our Wi-Fi infrastructure. And okay, we wanted to really go with IPv6 only for everything was the plan. We wanted to, to have it on our management plane, control plane, and data plane of the Wi-Fi infrastructure, and not just for the clients. Um, and that's what we'll be going through today of how we got on. Um, just also, I put in there for the future, well, where we'd like to go, we would like to go to an IPv6 only campus, if at all possible. Um, but we do realise there's a lot of work involved getting all stakeholders on board for that. 
and I suppose supporting legacy systems and software, but that would be the ultimate goal. So our motivations for going with IPv6 only for the project, um, like we wanted to progress the work we'd previously done with IPv6, um, you know, in the dual stack environment worked really well, but there were certain times where, you know, if something wasn't working, it was hard to identify because it would just fall back onto the other protocol. So, you know, with IPv6 only, we'll be able to see any issue that occurs more easily. Um, also, just on the other hand, when something did go wrong in the dual stack network, you know, sometimes the, the, what people were doing was just disabling IPv6 because they just went back to what they know with IPv4. So with our IPv6 only network now, it has to work and, and that's kind of our motivation for it. Um, also to manage one protocol instead of two is always good to get back to that. Um, we'd also wanted to provide a live IPv6 only environment uh, for research testing and, and development. And I think one of our biggest motivating factors um, was to, to try and promote an IPv6 first approach. Uh, and I guess what I mean by that is, you know, we went out to tender and we put it into our tender document that we wanted the state of the art Wi-Fi infrastructure. But we also said that we wanted it to be IPv6 enabled for everything if possible. And, um, you know, I think that's this is kind of the approach we need to get to if we want to try and get to that goal of IPv6 only campus, we need to be doing that for all new systems and software. So that's what we try to do. Um, foundations for our IPv6 only, I guess this is just some of the essential work that we've done previously, um, you know, that just made it enabled us to be able to do IPv6 only. So we had our IPv6 addressing plan, we had our DNS set up, we had a dual stack of inter firewall interfaces we had the dual stack of our internal infrastructure. So it just meant when we came in with our IPv6 only network, if we needed to get to anything on the internal infrastructure, we were going to be able to do it natively. Um, so that was useful to have. Um, another side of it is on our Wi-Fi, we use Edge Roam, which is educational roaming, and that requires a radius authentication. So we would have worked with HEANet on this um, prior to this project, just to ensure that we could do radius authentication over IPv6. So again, with our IPv6 only network, we would be able to natively do radius authentication internally and out to the national gateways. Um, DNS64, NAT64, uh, unfortunately, there's still some of the internet that uses IPv4. So, we had to have a way of doing that. And, and we'd done a certain amount of tests on that beforehand. So we were quite confident that our FortiGate firewall would be able to handle that side of things for us before we started. And then another one just to mention, and it's a big one really, the help and advice we got along the way from experienced IPv6 people. Um, like just from the very beginning with dual stack, there was the likes of Pat Clooney and WIT who had done dual stack previously. He just had help and advice for us along the way. Um, HEA and always are a great support to us and helped us enable IPv6. And then I also just have to mention Veronica here because before this project started, myself and Ian um, had a conversation with Veronica about IPv6 only and her experiences. And uh, we took an awful lot from that. And I think we just, after that call, I think we just came away with confidence that we could do this project with IPv6 only. So thanks Veronica for that. It's my pleasure. Um, okay, so goals for the project, um, you know, we wanted full campus coverage, we wanted to have the latest Wi-Fi technology, 802.11 AX Wi-Fi 6, uh, we wanted, as I said, to broadcast Edge Roam, but we also wanted the guest portal. Um, we wanted network management tools capable of identifying issues if anything occurred. Um, we wanted to be able to profile our users and devices if we needed to, um, traceability to see who's doing what on the network. And ultimately, as I said, a pure IPv6 only solution where possible. And just, yeah, so the features of IPv6 only. So I guess this, these are just some of the things that are a little bit different to what we had done with our dual stack environment. Um, you know, we, we would have had originally multiple VLANs and multiple subnets across our campus for our, v, for our Wi-Fi. But in this particular design, we went with a single VLAN with one large IPv6 subnet per SSID. Um, we also wanted to utilize Slack and RDNSS as much as possible and remove the need for the DHCP servers. Uh, so I'm glad to say that uh, 
we are provisioning our APs that, in that way and our, for our Wi-Fi clients, that's how they get their addresses and DNS information. Uh, RADIS authentication, as I said earlier, just over IPv6 natively, we, we managed to do that. And um, just uh, for network management, just to be able to support SNMP version 3, SSH, HTTPS, all of these things over IPv6. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to hand you over to Ian and he can actually go through how it all worked and how IPv6 went for us. Thanks, Alan. Um, I will outline the experience of implementing V6 only on the new wireless network. Um, as we know, wireless has become the primary network access method for today's evolving mobile environment and critical in the higher education space. Um, while this is not a presentation on wireless networking, it's necessary to outline the components mm -hmm. to sh show the integration that was required over V6 to get it working. Um, our scalable design deploys link aggregation and multi-chassis aggregation between the core aggregation and access layer. Uh, rooted links are utilized at the core with layer three path redundancy. Um, we implement a controller-based wireless design. The controller authenticates the user and bridges the user to the core for internet connectivity. Um, as Colin has outlined, our dual stack history, um, we only had IPv4 on the management plane on our previous network. And we set out to achieve to have all of this over V6 on this new network. And what I will cover is how the components of the design, um, how they do regards V6 uh, compliance. So these are the uh, components that I'll go over. There is the core aggregation access wireless, the physical and virtual servers, and the WAN edge. So the core ag aggregation. So the campus LAN not only provides wired and wireless connectivity for the local users, but becomes the core for interconnecting the WAN data center and internet access, make it a critical part of the network requiring a high availability design. Um, this is achieved with the Aruba 8325 switches, which use a, a VSX clustering technology for resilience. So as I said, I'm just gonna go through how each component um, worked out under V6. So. The core was compliant on layer three. Um, all of the routing and all of the SNMP, V3 and SSH were all done natively over V6. Uh, and everything worked there really well. Um, the only negative uh, was that the heartbeat address that's actually used for the clustering technology, that was done over V4 and it's the only V4 address on our network. So um, that's going to change, and there is a feature request in for that. Um, so onto the access layer, and the access layer in this design just prefer, provides the layer two connectivity for the wired and wireless device to the core. Um, so it's, it's just layer two switches with native IPv6 management addresses. Um, very straightforward there. Everything um, worked fine from a V6 compliance point of view. Um, the other area of access, obviously the most, most important from a, a wireless point of view is on the access point side. So we have Aruba 5XX access points uh, to efficiently serve multiple clients in dense environments over 2.4 and 5 gigahertz at high speeds. Um, again, the compliance here, um, our main uh, uh, work here was on the provisioning of the APs and these were deployed using Slack um, 
it's again just a small thing there you need to have a dns internet resolvable over v6 for that provisioning um again it worked really well everything uh we've actually added some ourselves and uh th they provision perfectly over v6 again just being picky there's just a small thing where there's a v4 dhcp can't be disabled but again there's a feature request in um for this uh, I suppose we move on then to the wireless part of the deployment. Um, again, here we have two physical mobility controllers, our managed devices under the mobility master, and these handle the AP terminations. Um, clustering the mobility controllers provides high availability and seamless roaming campus wide. Um, Big win for us here was getting uh, the latest version of the Aruba uh, OS 8.7, um, which enabled native V6 support on the controller. Again, a very important piece here is that this controller uh, was capable of actually doing radius proxy, which is very important for us for Edge of Rome. Um, this was important because another part of the solution that was supposed to do a clear pass could not do this. So this basically was a workaround. Um, and again, we were just grateful that, that it was a feature that was available. Um, I continue on here now to the virtual servers for the network provisioning and management. I mean, in effect, this is the software defined networking part of this. And these three um, VMs, well, there's two of each, actually six in total. Uh, I'll go to true individually and just confirm their function. And as I say, more importantly, their V6 uh, capability or status or compliance. So the mobility master, uh, the mobility master is a centralized management platform in a multi-tier architecture that provides the separation of the management control and forwarding plane. It maintains all the configurations, uh, including its own for each of the physical wireless controllers. Um, basically, it's the most critical part of the infrastructure. Um, again, though, more importantly, it IPv6 compliant, all good, no issues here. Everything just, as we say, just works. Um, On to Airwave, uh, Aruba Airwave is powerful, easy to network operation system that manages the wired and wireless infrastructure. Um, like it also provides granular visibility into devices, users and applications. Um, like it really is a really good piece of software providing visual RF and heat maps, for instance. But again, for this talk, it, um, you know, it does everything SNMP over native V6 with the latest version of the code. Um, again, we are getting picky, but I think that's what you want to hear. Uh, one of the features was that the licensing could only be done over V4. We licensed a product and then we took the V4 address off the network. Uh, feature request again has been submitted for that with, with Aruba. Um, clear pass. So this really is, is what was one of the big ones. Um, I say ClearPass is a policy management platform that assists in easily onboarding new devices, granting varying access levels and keeping the network secure with secure NAC. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, I'm sure people are aware of it. It's a, it's a very good piece of software, but this was a big but in the whole thing. Um, it didn't do radius proxy and radius proxy was really the only shortcoming of the complete design. As Colin has outlined, Edge Rome is our primary SSID. And we really want it and we want to, and we will use ClearPass because it, it gives visibility on logging capabilities and really helps in, in fault finding in, in our environment. Um, again, there is, there is a, a request in for this and, and we're, um, we'll have that next year. Okay. 
Um, the last piece of it then is the firewall. And to be fair, this was probably the made most straightforward. So uh, for the gate 1500Ds, as Colin said, we, we had tested the NAF64 and the DNS64, the routing over V6, um, everything was fully compliant. Okay. So overall experience and thankfully the last slide, um, it, it, it's basically job done from our point of view. Um, in, in what was a really complex, but a really enjoyable project. Um, we were working with Vodafone, uh, VEI, Aruba, and uh, colleagues here in AIT from provisioning VMs to installing access points. Um, however, I have to just mention, and I believe he's on the call, that uh, the contribution of Ben Riedel of VEI was immense in uh, successfully completing this work. Um, when I was just reviewing it there last week with Ben, he reflected that flexibility in approach was key to the success of this implementation because a strict structured project plan because of the extra testing and configuration and workarounds needed, um, you know, needed, needed that flexibility, which, which we provided and Again, as, as an, edu an educational institute, I, I think that's what we're here to do. Um, you know, on the overall IPv6, some of the applications do not have full v6 support. There's small things like host names need to be used rather than addresses interchangeably. And our belief anyway, Colin and mine, is that only for Ben's knowledge and patience, uh, things might have worked out differently on this project if it was somebody else dealing with this. Um, also, we have to give a big call out to uh, HP Aruba here in Ireland, Dahi de Fuita, who has been really supportive from the get-go with this when we've been talking about this over the years. And also Joe Neville of Aruba UK, who we've been on calls with. And they basically gave the direct support channel for Ben uh, when support issues were, uh, were brought up. Look, ultimately, uh, there's been a really uh, exciting and interesting project and as I see you can hear from Colin uh, we don't stop or intend stopping with uh, here um, but again as I said it was just a great project to work on and again I'd like to just thank Colin specifically and all the others and uh, that's it thank you any questions Is there any questions I, on the, on in the chat? My question would be: yes. What about uh, what about the users? What is the experience so far? Have you had uh, people on on this and any major issues? Yeah, sir, Veronica, I just missed that one there. <laughs> I got carried away when I thought I was finishing up. Yeah, um, look, the 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 reality here is we previous version of our wireless was only in certain parts of the college, so we're now called covering 64,000 square meters. Um, so there is complete campus-wide coverage. But I think to really answer your question, the speed uh, that the Wi-Fi 6 is delivering is just phenomenal, to be honest with you. And all of those pieces that I described there of the airwaves, and they really are working. Now, obviously, because of the pandemic, there have been a very much smaller number of students on campus, but we have had students on campus and both from the students and from the staff. Um, yes, the overall thing is it's just fast. That's all we get. I mean, there's students surfing the web at the end of the day. So um, that that is that part of it. That's great. That's great. So no issues with specific applications or things not working well, for the user. No, all good so far. <laughs> oh, great. That's great. I can see that Andre uh, has raised his hand. Uh, hello, uh, Andre Tzadkak from RipeNCC. I would have just a question about, uh, like, you said you have just one VLAN for the whole SSID. And I wonder in that case how you, like, trace which address belongs to which user of the, of the network, say, if you get a security incident 
regarding a IP address? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> and, and actually that's where the clear pass is meant to come into the equation, uh, which we don't have in place as of yet. So we're hoping the, the promise is that it will be the first quarter of next year where we will have the support we need and we'll be able to trace that way using ClearPass. Thank you. Uh, a qu quick question. Um, have you had many reports of uh, people unable to get to any particular resources or unable to use particular applications? I'm kind of thinking what historically issues are, I've seen issues with things such as Steam um i i can say so far well obviously there hasn't been too many people on site since this launched but so far we haven't come across any and that's not to say we won't but um we're just waiting to see what what does turn up i suppose okay. um yeah again i i think there um as we say it, the 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 network is is mainly used by the students for accessing uh, vle and online and all of the social media music and all of those applications are working. There is no issue. And we, we have made a point of being in contact with the student union to kind of hear if there are any applications that, that, that weren't functioning and, and we haven't heard of any, to be honest. Do you, do you have uh, any fallback plan? Should, uh, sh should there be some killer come to light that just doesn't work over NAT6 far? Well, I'm, I mean, the, the thing about it is I could say yes, but it's really no. Um, like, we, we, we can, like, as, as we explained in the design, we, we can put in a V4 um, segment. Um, so that, that, that is an opportunity or, or something we, we will obviously consider. Um, but again, I, I think, and I, I assume we, we just need to make this point, we are slightly different and, and we realize that in that it, it is students accessing the internet, but we also access our internal network for uh, virtual desktop uh, applications uh, and we haven't had any issues there uh, either. So like we're aware that, you know, the potential and, and yes, we can go back to, a, a, you know, a, implement a, a subnet for v4 but but basically we're, we're trying to do everything not to do that to be honest okay that, that's really encouraging i mean i, I so sorry for the uh <laughs> the, the two uh uh pointed questions but we're we're very much uh looking at going down this same route ourselves um as part of a wireless refresh we're looking at uh you know the possibility of transitioning uh our 25,000 user network over to v6 only but our early uh, attempts to see how big a problem it might be kind of suggested to us that there might be too much fallout with uh but not so much uh, uh users accessing our internal resources obviously we control those but um just a you know potentially a, a minor i mean a minority of uh, apps on the internet but some that may not wash with our students not being able to uh not being able to use them um, well, yeah, I, I'm no. gonna. I'm sorry. I'm gonna step in because of the time sake. So we're just gonna say, David, he's from Imperial College London, and uh, I will be very happy to put you, David, in touch with Colin and Ian, so you can actually uh, have a chat, you know, about different things. Okay. Um, or, great, or, great, great. Thanks. Discussion can continue after, but that I just would like to uh, thank very much to Colin and Ian for a very good talk. Uh, it's really encouraging to see that you managed to complete such an important phase of your project and that you plan to go further. So, continue.